You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 182 of the Healthy Critters Radio on Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you by Biostar US. Find them online at biostarus.com. On today's show, we chat with Jesse Woodall about bats. Critter of the show is the porcupine. In Critter Nutrition, we focus on puppy house training and surviving the Velociraptor puppy. And in Coffee Clatch, we ask, what is the most unusual treat you've ever given your horse? Join us. I'm Tigger. And I'm Patty. And I'm Coach Jen. Thanks for joining us again today, folks. We come out to your earbuds about twice a month and we chit chat about all things healthy and critter. I'm kind of excited about the porcupine. Don't know much about them, but they're so cute. <laughs> they are. Except if your dog gets. Uh, what? No spoilers. No spoilers. No reading ahead. No foreshadowing. Oh, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> and t- this is the part of our show that we affectionately call chit chat. It's to get our voices warmed up, um, allow whatever favorite beverage we're drinking to start to take an effect. In my case, it's going to be green tea. Oh, I thought for sure it was going to be wine. You know, it would have been if I had any. <laughs> oh. Uh, she'd be at my house. I've got wine. See, I should be at Patty's house. She's got mm-hmm. it right. Well, today today's chat, chat, chat um, topic is going to be 4th of July since we're recording this the day after the 4th of July. And those of us who have pets of all sorts, and even some humans, find the 4th of July a little bit frustrating because the sounds made by fireworks, which are now available to the general public, and I think every state, can be very, very difficult to deal with for a lot of us. So we're going to find out what everybody did for the 4th of July, good, bad, and otherwise. And Patty... How about you? Did you do anything fun? Did you have picnic? Did you hide under the covers? Did. What did you do? No, I'm so excited because I normally, normally like none of my family members are home. And I had both Ray and Peter, which is just a rare occasion, um, which makes me so happy. Although that happened last year, but then next year it won't happen because it will be Wednesday. But anyway, that's regardless. But we went to a parade down in this historical town called Granbury. And we had, so friends of ours bought a house down there, a lake house that's going to be an Airbnb. And um, we sat around, you know, and watched the parade. And then we just did some shopping. And there's just so much history to this town. So we ended up going through this old jail that was, and I'm, I, I think it was actually the jail they used until like 1978. And walked through the jail. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever done this. I, I love stuff with history. And so, so does my son, Ray. Um, just being in the room, like stepping in the room, knowing how many people had been in there. Oh, it was just, the energy was so, I had to get out. Like, I was like, I get to feel like, I'm like, I, I, I just wanted to behave. <laughs> it, was <just> really <laughs> unusual. it was just, it was, it was, but it was so cool. It was just a lot of fun. And, um, uh, and just going around and learning all about the history, about where we were. And, um, you know, there, there's the, the guys that were at, at the jail were, you know, they talked about all the, the ghost tours they have. And the one guy said, yeah, it's all, it's malarkey. There were, they, you know, and it was just kind of funny how like, you know, you, you talk to some of the town people and they're like, oh my gosh, this is true. And, the, and then the jail guy's like, yeah, it's malarkey. It never happened. So that part was <laughs> kind of funny, but it was just kind of neat just being able to be outside and, looking at all the people that get so serious about just, you know, being in the parade. So it was just, it was a, it was a great day. It's a great day. And take her. I did nothing. I mean, I stayed home. I weeded. It was great. It was <laughs> one of, it was one of those days that was, was kind of dull and boring and uneventful. And you liked it that way. I loved it. Yeah. I was, it was, it was hot. Yeah. And we had storms and it was just, it was just nice not to have an agenda for the day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I I was out at the barn earlier today, and the the gal who owns the barn stopped by and she said hi. How are you doing? I said I'm doing fine. What's going on? Oh, not much. There's really nothing going on. And I said to her, you know, I like it when my life is boring. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I I really appreciate boring every so often because that just means I can be chill and take a deep breath. And you need a certain amount of boring so that when the exciting parts come, you can either deal with them because it's the bad kind of excitement or you can enjoy them a lot more because it's the good kind of excitement. But you need to have that kind of ebb and flow. I I did have three Mm -hmm. consults. So it wasn't like I wasn't You were working, working, of course. Yes, you were Um, working. But it was just nice not to have, I've got to do this or I've got to do that. Or Yeah. Yeah. How we, about uh, you? What did we, you do? We had yeah. a, a rather boring 4th of July. We went out and visited the ponies. And right now here in Ocala, Florida, it is a little bit warmer than the surface of the sun. So we just took them out and <laughs> hand grazed <laughs> them and reapplied fly spray. And then said, good day. You have a good one. And then we had a store-bought. Fourth of July picnic of fried chicken and potato salad. Yum. Yum. And we watched the first Indiana Jones movie. Oh, how was it? Oh, the first one. Sorry. The first one. The first one. See, in anticipation of going one. to see the, the last one, <laughs> yes. the most recent one, we're going to go see it at the theater. So we have to binge and rewatch all of the previous of course. before we do that. So yesterday was the first one. It's the and, best one. And I think it is. Although... Although I do like the skull, the crystal skull. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And I did like the one with Sean Connery as the father. Who, who doesn't yes, love that? Yes, I love right? that one. Right. So we're going to watch all three of them. And and we enjoyed that because, you know, it's an older movie. and We've seen it a million times. So it's so much fun because you can talk over top of it and nobody in the room cares. Well, TBS, <laughs> I think it was TBS, was doing a whole Star Wars the whole weekend into last night. So I was binging big time. I was going to say, you did partake, <laughs> didn't you? I did. Yes. Uh, there we go. So that was our 4th of July. It was loud for three nights in a row here with fireworks. And last night was the loudest. It was it was staccato. The first, the first of the three nights was just an occasional boom. Night two was high caliber night. It was occasional boom. Regular booms, but they were really, really loud. And then last night was low caliber staccato. It just sounded like everybody in the neighborhood had a machine gun. Um, but lucky for us, our horses are reasonably immune to that sort of thing. And we weren't real worried about them. But I know for a lot of people, there's a, there's a lot of stress that goes along with that. So if all of a sudden our elected officials decided that you weren't allowed to buy a fireworks, except if you had a license to set off fireworks, I would be okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Our town did not do fireworks this year. And it was such a wow. tremendous relief. It was just, Oh, thank Because it, it, the dogs just, mm-hmm. it spooks the horses. The dogs yeah. just get, shivery and stressed yeah. and yeah. I had a neighbor shooting off stupid stuff, but um yeah. I just worry about A, people get hurt a lot. B, in a neighborhood where we live, each house is about eight feet from the next house. And I just get really yeah. worried about sparks and things and you know, but anyway, I wax. We had a lovely picnic. We ate, we watched Indiana Jones and now we are on July 5th. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Good for you. Good for us. We made it. Yay. Good for you. Yay. yay for us. And yay, speaking of yay, I think there's going to be a discussion about baths today. Am I right? Yes. Woohoo. Let's get to the bat lady. Okay. So we are here today with a lovely person that I got to meet yesterday in our barn, uh, Jesse Woodall. Jesse, thank you for agreeing to do this and coming on the show. Welcome. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the invite. I'm honored. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to share awareness about bats. Well, so as you guys may have figured out, we found a bat <laughs> in the barn and Trina, who owns the barn, um, somehow, and I'm not even sure how she ended up finding you. I guess she, she called, uh, we have a lot of wildlife around, somehow connected with Jesse, who we're now going to refer to as the bat lady. <laughs> <laughs> that works. And so, 
Yeah. So um, we had had a couple uh, dead bats that we had found over the last couple uh, weeks. And this one, uh, fortunately, was alive. And um, Jesse came and um, told us about our bat. And um, and, she, and, it, and uh, basically, she was a re- she's a red bat. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, she's an eastern red. Okay. And, um, she unfortunately had broken her wing and, but, but so what, so, so we're just going to kind of delve into it. And we'll get back to our bat. So basically I was so enthralled by all, the, all of this. I, how, and when did you get started into rehabbing bats? Um, I started probably about five years ago. Um, my sons were in the backfield and tromping around and started running, mom, mom, we found a bat. And, um, I was like, what? Like most people, like we have bats really. And, um, so I took a look at him. It was a mom with three pups and, um, unfortunately her wing was broke as well. And, um, so I called bat world, you know, Googled how, you know, what do I do with this bat? And, um, bat world popped up and I called Amanda, who is the founder of bat world. And, so I brought them over there. And um, at the time I was rehabbing raccoons and squirrels and um, I just fell in love with bats. Um, so they, you're, the, you're obviously uh, familiar with, with, with doing stuff with wildlife, which is kind of um, amazing. Um, so let's get into some of like the things, I mean, I, you know, we had, I, I, I'm from Virginia, Tigger's from, from Virginia. I don't know, Tiggs, if you have any bats, we used to have bats all the time. I in have our a farm. bat house. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Okay. So what are some basic like facts and myths about like bats and rabies and because everybody, everybody always hears about that. So, so can you just touch on that lightly? Absolutely. So the first thing, you know, somebody talks about bats, it's either gross, they're dirty um, or, oh, they have rabies. And so bats are super clean. They spend a third of their time um, awake cleaning themselves. They're very intelligent animals. Um, bat world's got bat cams that you can watch them figure out their little puzzles to get to their food. Um, and then rabies. So everybody thinks that um, they're asymptomatic and these bats are just flying around with rabies and giving it to everybody. And that's just, that's not true. Um, bat world has a fact sheet that states that half of 1% of all bats. Okay. So that's millions and millions, you know, just um, they half of 1% carry will contract rabies. So I'd like to, oh, wow. yeah. And so that's, that's a, big difference between what we think or people think of rabies to yeah and sure you run into that a lot when people end up calling you and having to educate them which is um, a big thing I know in what you do because we just in the 15 to 20 minutes that we were with you we learned so much about bats and you know so why do we need bats like what like how do they how do they help our our ecosystem like how what's why do we need them so, yeah, so my, my mentor, we, when we do our educational classes, you know, she she gives us this question. It says, if you were talking to someone that didn't know anything about a bat, you know, how would you describe it in one word? And so you got to sit and think about that. And um, the the word that we come up with is essential. We we have to have bats. Um, I don't know all the details, but Bat World has a lot of list of, you know, of things that we would not have if we didn't have bats. You know, one of them is the the um, the tequila um, plants. The, um, if we didn't have bats, that's the only bat. That's the only animal that um, pollinates that plant, and we wouldn't have oh, tequila or margarita. Um, there's gum, to yeah, um, and so there's a whole list of things. Pest control. Um, there's a orchard down south somewhere, and I can't remember the name of it, but they are completely organic for having bat houses for the night that help with um, the moth population that destroys crops. Right. And they have bird houses at night or in the morning or for the daytime. So um, it's a must. We, we've got to have these bats. Well, that's that's awesome. So can you talk a little bit about like what you did? So we called you. You told us to put the bat in a ventilated, you know, cardboard box and give him a little thimble of, of water. So what happened to our little female once you left our house? 
Yeah. So I wanted to touch a little bit on that. So um, our number one thing is never touch a bat barehanded, right? Um, For the safety of you and the bat. Um, And so I come, I pick up the bat as this situation. And unfortunately it did have two fractures in that one wing. And so um, when I got home and took took a look at her and um, I called bat world mid city, Miss Kate over there. And I was like, Kate, she's got one between the shoulder and the elbow, and that one's really hard to stabilize. So she's like, bring it to me. And so she's living her life. Unfortunately, they had to amputate that that wing. And so she'll live out her the rest of her life at Bat World Mid Cities. She's actually on um, their Facebook page right now. Oh, great. Okay. And what's yeah. the Facebook page? It's Bat World Mid Cities. Okay. Oh, I'm going to look that up. All right. Yeah. She's um, her cute little face so- is on there. Oh, okay. So, but how, how does that all work? Like, how is that funded? Like how, how does all that work? So um, it's, we are complete, I'm completely volunteer. Um, I do this out of love of bats. Um, I take, this is my time, my money. You know, I, I travel as soon as I can to get there to, to work with the bats. Um, All the medicine is um, I I fund myself. So it's just all volunteer work. Well, okay. So if somebody w- were interested in like helping support that, where do they go to do? Um, so that'll be an individual call. Um, I, I, I usually have a, um, a wish list. Um, I don't have it up on Amazon right now. Um, but I can do a wish list on Amazon for paper towels, just the simple things that I need every day to take care of these, um, bats. Um, okay. so that would be just a one-on-one getting a hold of somebody. Bat World is a um 501, so you can donate to them um to help because they have a lot of resources as well that they help. So do you think it's it's if you're in your in your specific area, it's probably better to d- donate like locally to somebody, or is it better Absolutely. to go through Bat World? Oh, either okay. way, okay. either either way. So, um, okay. you know, it's nice whenever you go to pick up a bat, if somebody would um, help out or just to spread, spread the awareness, you know, um, is number okay. one that helps us out um, well, this, to save these bats. Well, that's why we have you on, on the show for sure. Yes. Um, so what kind of bats do you find in your backyard? So tell us about, tell us about the little girl that you found in the barn and what kind of bat she was. Absolutely. So that's an Eastern red, Eastern red bats are solitaire bats. They um, just hang out by themselves. Um, we have evening bats, which are crevice bats that they colonize. They have, um, we have a lot of colonies around here. Um, the Mexican free tails, I've heard that y'all found in, in the barn over there. Um, they're colony bats too. And those are the, the colonies down South. Um, we also have tricolors, um, seminal bats, Silver hairs, um, hoary bats. Hoary bats are beautiful. Y'all get a chance to look them up. They're huge. They're they're pretty. Um, and I think in in our area, that's that's what we usually get in. Okay. May I, may I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. What what can we do to encourage bats in our own ecosystems? Absolutely. So um, getting the right bat house. So um, I've seen many bat houses online um, and in stores, and they're just not made right. Um, Batworld.com or bat, Batworld.org has um, uh, blueprints that shows you um, the right, how to, to build it correctly. So you can kind of look at that. And then once you go and look for a bat house to buy, you can kind of compare, you know, planting native um, plants that attract the moths that um, they like to eat. You know, number one insect is a moth and uh, mosquitoes. Um, let's see, what is the other one? True bugs and stuff like that. So just planting things that are native. So you don't have to worry about watering, you know, letting nature take its course. Um, Plants that will help. And no pesticides. No pesticides. Number one. Yes. Sorry. I just hit my desk. It made me excited. (laughs) (laughs) I I have a question too. Uh So are there circumstances? I live in a, I live in a subdivision. So the houses are 15 feet apart. Yes. Are there things that we can do 
to help bats thrive in these more urban settings? So, um, it, it's again, harder, I'm sure. <laughs> it is. It is harder with, you know, when we have the, the houses close together and you have, you know, you have pets, you know, cats, cats are number one, um, predators, um, of bats. We get a lot of bat, uh, cat caught bats. And so it's kind of hard to say, yeah, go ahead and put up a bat house, you know, and, um, you have all these predators because they have to be, you know, 10, 15 feet up high. Um, so they have, you know, room to drop and take flight. Um, so again, I would go back just, um, native plants and tracting those bugs and, um, feed so that, you know, we'll have and go and go to bat it, world and make sure you install your bat house correctly. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I didn't I didn't realize that they needed that kind of a height, but that makes sense because when they fly away from wherever they've been napping all day, mm-hmm. they have they're dropping from their little toes because they hang. Yeah. They yeah. need yeah. that height. So if you've got mature, taller trees, that might give you an opportunity. But if you live in one of those kind of a neighborhoods that there's nothing more than six feet off the ground, that yeah. might not be an ideal situation to put a bat house in because you're just putting that bat at risk if he does decide to use it absolutely yes for the local practice so it's yeah. batworld.com is that right batworld.org yes Not batworld.org which i'm sorry is an awesome <laughs> website name <laughs> yeah, that, yeah it is batworld.org well thank you very much for coming on the show today this has been fascinating <laughs> it's great thank, thank you so much honor. thank you for all the work you do for the bats Absolutely. Amen. I just again, again want to stress out, you know, never touch a bat barehanded because if we have um, human bat contact, you know, we have to send it in for testing. And I just want to stress that call somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, batworld.org is the number one and you can find a, a close rehabber near you. And in case I, we were not going to be overly delicate here, in case you didn't know, when a creature is tested for whether or not it has rabies, there's only one way to do the test. Yep. And the animal in question has to be euthanized to, to do the test. So Absolutely. don't touch right. the bat, people. Don't don't touch the bat. Touch yes. the bat. <laughs> find find a local you. rehabber, somebody that knows uh, what they're right. doing and, and um, the behavior of the of the animal as well. <laughs> Hello, Hedwig. Hey. Hola, amigas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's she's bilingual now. Multilingual. Multilingual. Bonjour, Multilingual. Here we go. Uh, we have an important question for you today. Très bien. Earlier Ooh. in the show, we were chit-chatting about what we did over the for the 4th of July holiday. And one of the things that myself and my significant other did is we sat down and rewatched Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It was our first, the first one, the original, in preparation for the new one coming out in movie theaters. Is there, does, does Hedwig, the world's only podcasting Pomeranian, have a favorite film or a favorite film franchise? Oh, this is a fascinating question. I'm glad really? you know that. I mean, <sighs> Let me begin by saying that there are certain films for certain moods and certain times of year. So in the summer, I like to have my servant queue up two films. One is my favorite, Jaws, which is about a big oh. angry shark and a little boat. That's beautiful, that movie. In fact, when the man says, I think we're going to have to find a bigger boat. I always think to myself, I think you should have had a smaller dog. But, you know, (laughs) that's just me. And then another summer favorite is The Shining. Because (laughs) it's about snow and going crazy. The Shining. The Shining. Because oh it's got a man with an axe in and totally crazy man. And it's snow, snow, snow. So when you're hot, it's a good movie for watching. So those are my two summer favorites. Now, toward Christmas, it's important to watch movies that make you remember your values, such as how much you love cake. No, 
your family and other such things. <laughs> so, you know, I like to revisit such movies, you know, like the Charlie Brown. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a favorite. That's the and best yeah. Christmas special, Charlie Ever. Brown. Yeah. yeah, and the servant likes the one with the Hugh Grant being the prime minister, but, you know, she has character weaknesses, and so we try not to cater to that. Love, actually. Yes, she likes to watch it, and, you know, she likes Joni Mitchell as well, and so then it's just that big sob fest for, like, a year. <laughs> and then we're all supposed to remember our how much we value our relationships and how we should not be a hoe, but... <laughs> Sometimes I just am overcome by the need to turn that one off. So there you go. I do like the dance scene with Hugh Grant, though. That funny. <laughs> um, and then let's see. When I'm sad, I like to watch a funny movie like The Airplane. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> and The Naked Gun, one, two and a half, and thirty-three and a third. <laughs> Oh, that a, so that, that's your that's the first franchise you've mentioned. So the yes. airplane franchise is big on your list. Okay, good to know. Yeah, mm, those are so funny. Leslie Nielsen makes me laugh until I puke out my nose. <laughs> and then um, let's see. There's a very funny movie that other people have not really mentioned often. Eddie Murphy called Boomerang. <laughs> so funny. Oh my god, you just cannot even with that one. And then when you're looking for satire, the Blair Witch Project is a laugh a minute. <laughs> I thought I would not have described it, that one as a laugh me, a minute, but neither, there we go. I'm going to have to rewatch that with, with a laugh a minute in mind. Definitely you know a, a Pomeranian viewpoint. Yes. My servant was thrown out of the theater for laughing through it when it first came out. <laughs> Well, that's one of those character flaws that you mentioned earlier. Oh, so many. But it is yes. pretty funny once you realize that it's really just funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been fascinating. Now I, I have added to my list of, of films to watch during the summer once while it is a pro the approximate temperature of the surface of the sun here in Ocala, Florida. And oh. thank you very much, Hedwig. The shining. The shining. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. And now it's time for the breed of the show. So we are at the porcupine portion of the program. <laughs> the prickly portion. The prickly, the prickly portion. portion of the porcupine. So um, this was a Tiggy suggestion, and I think it was a good one. I learned I learned a lot. Um and there's a lot more to learn. And some of it was a little bit over my head and I need more, I need a year to figure out, but let's just go with the basic stuff I found out. Um, a porcupine is basically a large rodent. Didn't know that. Um, makes sense, but they have sharp spines or quills over its whole body that protects them against predators. There are many different types and families, um, but basically all display the similar coats of a rigid, semi-rigid quill. Um, which are modified hair composed of keratin. The largest species of porcupine is the third largest living rodent in the world, which is a, I'm not going to say this right, a capybara. Capybara. Yes. Capi From yes. South America. Okay. Yes. Yes, indeed. And a beaver, which I was like, what? Which I wow. guess makes sense because you think it's a But anyway, I didn't, I didn't delve into that, but I'm sure that's a whole, a whole thing. Uh, most porcupines are, and this is a generalization because there's old world and new world. Totally didn't get into that. I just touched on it lightly. But most porcupines are about 25 to 36 inches long with an 8 to 10 inch tail weighing in about 12 and up to 35 pounds. <laughs> um, they are round, whoa, whoa. Uh, rounded, large, slow um, <laughs> little critter and basically... Um, uses visual threat to the predators to leave them alone, which are their quills. Um, this is kind of cute. A baby porcupine is called a porquette. <laughs> and when they are born, they have soft hair and they harden within a few days. Can you imagine? A porquette. It's really? Like, oh my God. Oh my God. Look how cute they are. And then all of a sudden, yeah. Um, okay. So there's, and again, this was a little over my, my pay grade, but so there's old world porcupines and new world porcupines. Um, the old world porcupines, it's hard to say, 
tend to have fairly large spines that grow in group clusters. Interesting. New World porcupines are mostly smaller. However, the American porcupine um, can get up to 33 inches in length, but their quills attach in a simply rather group-like cluster. So I guess there are different ways that they can, they're, they're between the old world and new world, the way they're, the, the quills cluster on their back is different, which I would have never have thought of that. But anyway, Me um, yeah, so apparently they're excellent climbers. They spend most of their time in, uh, in trees. Diet of the porcupine. They're basically an herbivore ah. and obviously climb for, yeah, for, for their food. They eat leaves, herbs, twigs, green plants, clover in the winter, and they will end up even eating bark. All right, so let's get to the good stuff, the quills. Defensive behavior displays in a porcupine depends on um, uh, a, a lot of different factors. Um, but the biggest thing is, is that if they are, when, when they're, when they become agitated or annoyed, there's four different mains of like displays of a porcupine. This is rated from least to most aggressive. Number one, quill erection, which I would have thought would have been more aggressive, but apparently that's the least aggressive of the things they do. Number two, teeth chattering. Ready for number three? Odor admission. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And so not only are they sharp, attack. they're stinky. Yep, yep. And number four, they attack. Okay. Um, kind of a cool fun fact. The rattling of the quills is aided by hollow quills at the back of the porcupine. Kind of cool, right? Because apparently they make a rattling kind of noise. Wow. So they're wow. so they're a, they're actually the a rattle. rattlesnake with four legs. Yeah, but yeah, so but they're hollow in the back. Little small, small sidelines that I saw in several different places that I was researching. There is a possible antibiotic property within the quills, and apparently it has to do with the fatty acids um, that coat the quills, and they believe to actually aid the porcupine if he does any type of self-injury in healing itself. Wow. Kind of cool. um, so, so basically the, the, the quill itself is just, it's, it's a hair coated with of carrot, of keratin kind of like, I guess, sort of like our fingernail and it's embedded to in the muscle muscular structure of the porcupine. Um, the quills can be released um, by contact, or they can actually just drop out, drop off when they shake. Kind of a new thing. This is kind of cool. New quills grow back. That's kind of cool. Didn't know huh. that. Porcupines will occupy small range habitats. Their living space can be from like the forest desert to a rocky, uh, hill, uh, rock, rocky dirt terrain, um, hillside, or even tropical. That, that explains kind of their wide variety of um, eating habits. So a mother porcupine, when she is pregnant with her porcettes, <laughs> or <laughs> not, not sure I'm not saying that right, is pregnant for about 210 days, about seven months. They That's can have long. anywhere from one to three. I know, very long. Most porcupine baby, this is this blew my mind, blew my mind. So they're they're pregnant that long, but they're ready to live on their own in about two months. That just doesn't seem fair when you think wow. about humans, but that's another topic. Um, <laughs> they can live; <laughs> they can live in uh, their lifespan um, in the in the wild can be uh, ten to fifteen years, and in captivity anywhere from ten to twenty. So, I found this really kind of cool. Um, porcupines actually mate for life, and they live in small family groups with their offspring, which I thought was so cute. Another kind of just an interesting fact is um, they, the, the, they, so they mate for life. And apparently they will mate, the, the male porcupine and the female porcupine will, will mate daily, even when she's not in heat. And they, the, the reason behind this is they think it strengthens their pair bond. Isn't that sweet? Aww. I thought that was sweet. Anyway, um, moving on. Um, during mating season, both the male and females make <laughs> a sound that sounds like whales, kind of shrieks and sirens and screaming, which I'm sure is very attractive. Um, 
but that's the, the male porcupine's intent on winning his mate. So he has to really practice patience and perfect timing because the female porcupine is only fertile from anywhere from eight to 12 hours a year. I mean, that's, that's like a hit or miss thing. And last but not least, I thought this was kind of, it was interesting. Um, they act a, as an ecosystem engineer because they disturb the soil, like with foraging and, you know, playing with a uh, plant community. And um, because they're a selective herbivore, they, the type of disturbance activity, they promote rare, um, they can promote, and depending, and, and of course, porcupines are all over the world, so I'm sure this isn't just here, but, but they can promote rare and endangered bul- bulbs and help maintain biodiversity. Oh. So basically, they, they help the ecosystem. I, I like, and all the stuff that I've read about different critters, I'd never really thought about how they help, can help the, the planet and like how they can, you know, help the ecosystem. So apparently because they're, they get their little nose down in the dirt, they um, can help the community of, you know, herbs and bulbs and, you know, they move the dirt around. And so they help the ecosystem. So I they're like little tiny of plows. Little, yes. They're like plows. Yeah. So there you go. The porcupine. Wow. Who would have known? That's very cool. I thought so. And there's like, if anybody finds this interesting, I just basically touched it because it gets between the old world and new world. That's like right off the top of the bat when you start looking at it. And I'm like, okay, I just wanted to find out about the quills and what they do and how they, you know, what they do. And because, you know, of course we in Virginia, I had many a dog that was attacked uh, or, or had, you know, porcupine quills and um, Tigger, I'm sure you have too. None. Have you had it? Seriously? Seriously. Oh, that's great. Okay. So we, well, we had a couple Jack Russells. And when I say a couple, we had a bunch and they would go, you know, down and burrow in the holes and they would come out with porcupine. And, uh, it is not a fun thing. And now we're at Critter Corner. And this is the continuing Puppy Chronicles, us <laughs> training toys and surviving the, the Velociraptor. My Australian Shepherd puppy, Kenobi, is now 12 weeks old. We have been together for three weeks. In that time, he has me seriously wondering whether to buy stock in Resolve carpet cleaner, invest in falconry gloves to protect my hands from puppy teeth, and sign up for a dog toy addiction group therapy session. God. Grant me the serenity to accept that I buy my puppy too many toys, courage to buy fewer toys, and the wisdom to ignore Chewy.com ads. <laughs> I prefer the term house training to house breaking. House breaking sounds like teaching a future burglar, a four-legged bandito. Also, I don't like the word break. I don't want to break this puppy. Just help him direct his urine and other bodily eliminations outside. Last week, we had one day of no potty training mistakes. None, zero, nada. Eureka, I said, telling him what an absolutely perfect, brilliant Einstein of a puppy he was. The next day, five peas and one poop on the same carpet. Yes, I counted. (laughs) Yesterday, we had two puppy pee mistakes, both while I was on the phone. I blame myself. I will say he has not used his crate as an indoor bathroom facility. He can sleep through the night until 5 a.m. or until the adult dogs start answering the coyotes and singing to them at 2 a.m. I rarely use the word no for house training or any other correction. I use uh uh-uh or uh uh-uh or uh uh-oh. I think those sounds make more sense to puppies and adult dogs. I make the sounds quickly and precisely. I don't yell. I don't point my finger at the puppy. As soon as Kenobi responds, I say yes or good boy. I do occasionally get some assistance from the resident hall monitor, also known as Wookie. If she sees Kenobi doing something wrong, such as grabbing a shoe, pulling the Afghan blanket off the couch, taking papers off the coffee table, she intercedes with a growl or a bark. It is very effective. The Velociraptor stage, a.k.a. what happened to my cute little puppy. 
The velociraptor stage is when the puppy turns into a creature from Jurassic Park. The adorable, cuddly puppy is now all teeth with an obsession of putting anything and everything into its mouth. Kenobi is in the velociraptor stage. Teeth like little daggers, piercing hands, fingers, clothes, ankles, and my new Patagonia pants. He tries to chew on rattan, suede slippers, a tasseled rug, Keen's rough, my bathroom, my knee brace, sticks, pieces of paper. Did I say my fingers? He has the agility of a velociraptor too, jumping, leaping on me, other dogs, dog gates, chairs, and his assorted toys. Ground rules for velociraptors. I've learned after raising eight Australian shepherds to have very specific ground rules when it comes to the velociraptor stage. When Kenobi tries to jump on me, I make myself very big, like I am the King Kong of humans. I correct him with eh -eh, and the request for off. He is an Aussie, so he will test me. Does she really mean it? As soon as he stops and either sits or looks at me with all paws on the floor, I tell him how awesome he is and treat. Now, giving treats to a velociraptor requires teaching some basic boundaries. I keep the treat in my fist. He jumps or tries to bite my fist or approach with an open mouth. I pull my fist away. I offer it again, closed fist. And if he just waits, then I open my palm and let him have the treat. But the treat is always accompanied with praise. One thing I learned a long time ago with an Aussie, you cannot wear a velociraptor out. If these pups get overtired, then you are in deep kimchi. An overtired puppy is like a velociraptor on steroids. The biting, the jumping, the lack of self-control gets way worse. And the falconry gloves you saw on Amazon may become a necessity. The best way to decompress a velociraptor puppy is to engage their brain. Puzzles that include food are a great way to get puppies thinking. However, Kenobi so far is not much of a problem solver. He's more of a man of action. So I use a tug toy game, let him win, and rewarding him when I ask him to release or let go. The tug toy game lasts about two or three minutes. Then he ambles over to his favorite spot under my chair and naps. Finally, peace in the kingdom. Once or twice a day, for not more than a few repetitions, I will teach Kenobi something new or review what he already knows. Come, sit, stand, look, wait, trade. I just started teaching him leave it, one of the most important skills for velociraptor puppies and for the sanity of the entire household, particularly the cats. Bonding. Kenobi and I didn't bond immediately. We observed each other like new roommates with moments of being on a blind date. I didn't have any expectations, and I don't think Kenobi did either. He was just trying to navigate this new environment, new house, new dogs, new sounds, new people. And I endeavored to provide a routine he could trust, boundaries to keep him safe and playtime. And then one day we clicked. He really looked at me. I really looked at him. It was a brief and profound connection. At that moment, we both said simultaneously, I see you. I get you. I want to be with you. To seal the deal, he picked up one of my sneakers and ran off with it. The toy paradigm. My adult dogs don't give a hoot about toys, except when there is a new puppy in the house. When Kenobi arrived, all the other dogs wanted his toys. So, naturally, I bought toys for all the dogs, which they promptly played with for three nanoseconds. Trying to find the right, the best, the perfect toy for Kenobi has been an exercise in futility. One day he loves, loves, loves the big fluffy llama. The next day, the llama has been kicked off the island. And Kenobi is smitten with the squirrel or the beaver or the hedgehog or my shoes. I found a cute Star Wars themed tug toy since Kenobi is named for the Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. He bashed it around and I thought, aha, the perfect toy. After about one minute of delightfully beating and whipping the tug toy around, he dropped it and has ignored it ever since. Even when I try to play tug with it. Nope, not interested. He likes the tug toy that has fake fur on it. At this point, my living room is the FAO Schwartz of dog toys or maybe a stuffed animal zoo. We have a bunny, a fox, a lamb, a panda, the aforementioned llama, the beaver, the hedgehog, the squirrel, a turtle, a sloth, an octopus, and one minion. So far, no toys have been harmed, dissected, eviscerated, nor have the white fluffy innards been tossed around the house like confetti. 
I'm sure that will come later. Stage two of Velociraptor. (laughs) Real horses and real dogs are healthier, perform better, and recover more quickly on real food. That's why Biostar empowers horse and canine owners with 100% whole food nutrition, supplements, and feeding programs. Biostar products are made at their own certified non-GMO facility in Gordonsville, Virginia, using real fruit ingredients that are raw, freeze-dried, or dehydrated, never cooked, and are free from artificial flavors, colors, soy, corn, wheat, and molasses. The Biostar product line includes a wide range of whole food, horse and dog supplements, treats, and unique artisan poultices that embrace the ancient and traditional uses of clay and plants. Visit BiostarUS.com today and learn about whole foods and canine and equine nutrition so you can make the best decisions about the care and health of your horses and dogs. That's BiostarUS.com. Whole food nutrition the way nature intended. So now we're at Coffee Quatch. And the question is, what's the most unusual treat you've ever given your horse? (laughs) I I have to admit that, and this was years ago, um, I gave um, my event horse Cracker Jacks. Oh, God, (laughs) that's funny. (laughs) Well, I was eating them and he was interested in them. And then I, I found that was like his secret. Yeah, I got to tell you, I love Cracker Jack. I wouldn't have shared. You so (laughs) I don't think I would have shared. And when I was starting Biostar, now these these things don't seem unusual. But you know, I was experimenting with sprouts and kale and cabbage, and you know, so that was kind of unusual. But now, not so much. But yeah, that's 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 as inventive as I get in the treat area for horses. How about you, Patty? I well, okay. There's a, there's a couple of so a potato chip. I'm just going to say it. A potato chip. I I I had some chips. I had a horse that leaned over and it was like, hey, what is it? And then, which I wasn't completely happy about. But I was like, holy cow. That that's completely bizarre. But in the same day that that happened, um, my friend was standing there. We were, we were eating sandwiches, and her horse leaned over and took a bite of her like turkey club sandwich <laughs> and wanted to eat more of it. Not no, kidding. not kidding, not kidding. So I, I, I mean, my potato chip thing was nothing compared to that. So I, I, let's just go down with a sandwich, a sandwich. Oh my gosh, that a turkey be... sandwich. <laughs> PB and J yeah. I would get, but a turkey sandwich, wow. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, yeah, what horse wants to eat meat? There you go. Well, so, you know, in they're... India, um, and this is going back, you know, when the British ruled, they actually fed their horses fish. Really? Yep. Oh. Huh. Dried fish, not fresh fish. Eek. Wow. Yeah. How yeah. About you? How about you, Tigger? I I just said Cracker Jacks. Oh, Cracker Jacks. That was your thing. Okay. Uh, why? By the way, what inspired this this topic? Yeah, I'm always curious. I don't know. It just popped into your head. Yeah. Adult beverage calls it. Okay. So the most unusual thing, um, circus peanuts. I'm dating wow. myself because most people probably most people probably don't even know what a circus peanut is. But feed it to peanuts. the elephants. <laughs> <laughs> circus peanuts yeah. are those oh little gosh, orange marshmallow those. things. Yes. That if you're under the age of 81, I don't think you have ever eaten one. But yes, they had to be stale. We had one horse who loved circus peanuts, but she would not oh, eat yeah. them unless they were stale. They had to be kind of a little hard and crunchy. Um, we had a pony once. Our Our first pony that belonged to all of us kids. The pony was free. We went to pick it up. Um, it was in the back of an old bank barn, and all you saw were two glowing eyes. And uh, oh wow! Yes, it was the pony, and the pony was free, and the saddle was five dollars. So you know what kind of pony he was. The pony would literally eat 
anything. If it came for your hand, he would eat it, including mittens, oh. bread, and the bag it came in, oh. and earthworms. What? He uh, ate what? earthworms. Yes. We were so grossed out, we never did it again because you know, we kind of did it on uh-huh. a lark. But uh, yeah, he ate the earthworms that we gave him you know, out of our hand. Yeah. He was an amazing little pony. He made it to probably, he was probably 40 years old when he finally kicked the bucket. But he put up with the crap of generations of children who were just clueless and deserved to be dumped on their heads. And he didn't. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he, was a, he was a gem of a pony. Had no training before we got him. I don't think he'd ever worn the $5 saddle before we got him. You had to corner him in the oh corner of a pen to catch him. And we would all ch- hold hands. And you would have to position the largest child in the group just far enough away because as soon as you got him cornered with all all our us little kids holding hands, he would double barrel whoever was closest. <laughs> so we learned exactly how long his legs were. Yeah, so funny. Old blackjack. Yeah, that's- I have a friend who loves peeps at Easter. Yeah. And so she decided to decorate the barn in peeps. I mean, she put peeps everywhere and she oh, lined it up in front of her horse's stall, you know, between the bars and he ate all of them. All of them. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. well, peeps that's are an acquired terrible. taste, human or horse, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Have you guys ever had a chocolate covered peep? Ew. No, I got to tell I you, won't even eat the yellow ones. <laughs> I got to tell you, um, I. I am not like that person at all, but that they, it was good. I haven't seen them in years. Don't, but it was don't good. knock it till you tried it then, huh? Well, exactly. Okay. I'm going to keep an open mind come uh, Easter next year. I'm going to try a right, chocolate covered right. peep. If anybody knows where to get a chocolate covered peep, by the way, because I have not seen them in the stores, <laughs> please go to Healthy Critters Radio on Facebook. Let us- and let, and us, let know. us know where. <laughs> where let us know where we can get a chocolate covered peep and if you want to earn extra brownie points when you get them um let me know jennifer at horse network.com and we'll make sure that patty has some so that she can try them on the show <laughs> just, just offering Perfect. that up for you there we go well that wraps thank it up you. for today ladies yep thank you girls Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks to our sponsor, Biostar US. You can find them online at biostarus.com. Get the Horse Radio Network phone app on iOS or Android by searching for Horse Radio Network in the App Store. It's free and easy to use. For details about today's show, go to healthycrittersradio.com, where you can find links, photos, and more information about our guests. As always, we love your feedback. Please follow us on Facebook under Healthy Critters Radio. Be sure to visit all the great shows on Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Love your dog. Hug your horse. Feed your chickens. Clean your litter box. Dance with your goat. Slither with your snakes. Howl at the moon. Hang with your hamster. Party with your parrot. Waddle with your walrus. Outwit your otter. Cuddle your cows. Rap with your raptor. Go chipping with your chipmunks. Forgive your fox. While hedging your hog. We also recommend that you rack with your raccoon. Gyrate with your giraffe. Meditate with a meerkat. Uber with your orangutan. Facebook with your flamingo. Ponder with your panda. Walk with your wookie. Yawn with your yak. Twitter with your toucan. Go raining with your reindeer. Dropbox your dragon. (laughs) 